So now we're going to talk about transparency in financial services. Traditional financial systems have limited visibility, call for the intervention of intermediaries, and can limit underrepresented populations from having access to finance. They also consume comparable amounts of energy to blockchain solutions, if not more. If decentralised financial instruments can tackle the challenges brought into play by traditional financial systems through the development of the right infrastructure, what are the best steps forward? So this is what we'll be discussing today, looking at the importance of transparency in finance. I'm honoured to be moderating a panel with these incredible panellists, who I'm now going to ask to introduce themselves. Massimo, if we could start with you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Massimo Morini. I'm Chief Economist of the Algorand Foundation. Algorand is, is a public blockchain, and in my activity, uh, I look at our DeFi, at our uh, tokenomics and, and our economy, and our relationship also with, in a sense, the financial system. Uh, before that, I was in the traditional financial system because I worked as a head of quants uh, at uh, Intesa San Paolo, that is the largest, the largest Italian bank. So I find the topic today very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Corey Thane. I'm the Vice President of Global Policy at Circle. Um, Circle is the um, largest uh, regulated issuer of payment stable coins in the world. Um, prior to this, I was in big law in uh, Washington, D.C., and I spent four years uh, in the Obama administration. Hi, I'm Ted Moynihan. I'm the uh, managing partner of Oliver Wyman Financial Services. Um, so we're a consulting firm. Um, quite a large uh, player in financial services. There we go. Um, we're significant in financial services. We're about 300 partners around the world uh, with the sort of uh, the teams associated. And um, uh, you know, most of our work is with governments and large incumbent players, although uh, the um, blockchain community and uh, the crypto community has been really growing part of our business over the last few years. Um, I'm certainly no technical expert in any of these topics. But I have watched the sort of evolution, you know, of the path, the you know, the regulatory landscape, the involvement of the traditional world in in, in this space, um, and you know, been fascinating for us and very interested in the conversation. Thing. Hi, I'm Sue. I turned it off, so it is on now. I managed to turn it off instead of on. I'm um, Suzanne Morsfield. I am the global head of accounting solutions for Luca. We are a data and software company that serves the largest and small. We serve all size institutions that are engaged in the, with crypto assets, and digital assets of any kind. Um, I help with the accounting and tax solutions piece of the business, but I'll, as we talk today, I can, I can talk to you about more about other aspects of what the community needs um, that's um, engaging in financial services. Quickly, just will say, I too have a traditional finance and, a, and actually accounting auditor background. So I was on the sell side at Morgan Stanley, buy side at JP Morgan. I was an auditor at EY. And I also served in the International Accounting Standards Board as a staff member. So really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Asmaya. Very esteemed panel. Thank you for joining us today. So Massimo, I'm going to start with you. Um, and the first question I wanted to ask you is, is there capacity in the current financial system? And what are the real world implications and risks? And how can blockchain help with these risks? Well, I, I don't know if there is a, an opacity problem in, in, in the current financial system. Obviously there was in, uh, in the past uh, in some markets, uh, but I would like to turn the question the other way around. What are the advantages of transparency, you know, more than problems of opacity? And, and that's what we can see in, in the world of public blockchain, you know. I mean, problems can happen uh, even in public blockchain, but they tend to happen in the non-decentralized and non-transparent part of any business that also does, does blockchain. And in a sense, transparency in blockchain, for example, in decentralized finance, uh, uh, is also a way to risk manage, you know. It's, it's also a way to avoid that uh, uh, a problem uh, is not noticed, because otherwise we know what happens, you know, when there is no transparency. Taking the, 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 the point of view of financial stability, of the stability of a business, of the stability of a market, you know. Uh, in, under opacity, big issues uh, can actually 
happen and you only see them exploding at the very end, you know, with losses and big problems. Using transparency better, and even in blockchain, it's amazing because we, 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 we have everything transparent, you know, in the blockchain. And still we don't use that enough, you know. There's not enough awareness in the community, there's not enough uh, awareness in everyone using blockchain services of everything that we can done, you know, thanks to the transparency of, uh, of the flows. So in my opinion, for risk management, for stability, and, uh, um, you know, for better, uh, better financial and monetary system, transparency can be an amazing tool. Obviously, this is only an angle, but I'm sure that the other panelists will, will talk about the others. Who'd like to jump in next? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, so if you think about <clears throat> the way that the US uh, regulatory agencies are set up. You know, the SEC is all about disclosure. That's what most of the rules are uh, for. But there are notable uh, uh, problems and notable, um, like you said, blow-ups, failures, right? So I think back to 08 and 09, because uh, I lived through it as a litigator doing bet the company cases for financial institutions. And uh, you talk about opaque. I mean, look at the derivatives, the over-the-counter derivatives market almost brought the entire United States and possibly global financial um, uh, infrastructure to its knees. Um, and, and that was, you know, uh, unforgivable uh, that it got to that point. Um, and today we have shadow banking and there's all, despite all the rules, people tend to find nooks and crannies where there isn't disclosure. And why do we have disclosure? Why are the regulatory agencies geared towards that? is to create trust because finance ultimately is all about trust. So for instance, at Circle, one of the things that we do, um, you know, for payment stable coins, the most important thing you can know is that we can pass the show, show me the money test. If you give us a dollar, there better be a dollar waiting on the other end, right? So uh, we publish to our website every month precisely everything that we're holding backing our holdings. Um, we have uh, a major accounting firm attest to that. And then you can actually see down to the QSIP level um, what treasuries we're holding. And we do that to gain trust. And so the more that blockchain can be used to develop trust, I think you then help build economies that are healthier um, and you do better by consumers. I think these are all wonderful perspectives. I'll you know, sort of tell a funny story that when I first joined the financial, financial services industry, it was with a comp company called Capco, and it was many years ago, so it goes, it goes back to the point of some of the opacity is, has been dealt with since, but I remember that I was, I was on the accounting team, so I didn't know a lot about financial services, and someone, one of our consultants was telling me, yeah, at any point in time, if you're moving your money from this account to that account, you're wiring money, nobody knows exactly where it is in the system. And, and I remember, you know, I was 40 at that time. I had no idea that there was that level of opacity, of sort of lack of clarity around how financial transactions are moving to, through the system. And so part of what I think about is the progress since then, but also what more can we do, what more can we add because of this new technology. And I also think about, you know, there's, there's transparency, you know, from, in my mind, you know, sort of at least along two angles, but I'm sure the panel might have more, but is sort of the transaction is moving through the financial system or moving through from point A to point B. There's, you know, opportunities for more transparency there, but then also around what the it is that is moving. What is that that's moving and uh, through? What is that asset? What is that, you know, um, so, you know, cryptocurrency, whatever, what all is it comprised of? And, and, and there's transparency around that that's now available as well that there didn't used to be. So. I'm, um, I'm going to go with a yes. Um, I agree <laughs> with Basso that there's, there's new wonderful things we can do. But I think that there is a problem uh, with the system. Um, first of all, the cost of the transparency we have is enormous. And ultimately, that cost gets passed on. Um, and secondly, the transparency that we have is pretty much acquired through the regulation of the regulated parts of the industry. Um, and that, that does mean, you know, and there's a lot of concern now that by clamping down on risk taking or risk holding in the regulated parts of the industry, where is that gone? You know, and it's very real. The LDI stuff that happened in London, 
you know, around the wonderful Trust Quartang thing, you know, was pretty scary. Um, Oliver Wyman just published the review of the uh, London Metal Exchange and what happened with the nickel market. You know, the, just the level of, of information available sort of is really, really poor. Um, so I, I do think there's really something to solve uh, here. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Corey, if we think blockchain can help increase transparency, is that <coughs> public or private, permissioned, non-permissioned? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a role for both, right, um, depending on what you're trying to achieve. You know, JP Morgan is using private blockchains to digit, you know, tokenize deposits, right? But for us, we think that it is very important from a values perspective and also just from a competitive perspective to allow value to transfer on public blockchains. Because then you have blockchains essentially competing, A, to uh, do better, right? Um, to be faster, be cheaper. Um, and then you have that level of uh, public discoverability um, that has to be you know, balanced with some, some privacy enhancing measures. But that's how you sort of get to um, being able to uh, follow flows uh, and get to some of the transparency that we're aiming for. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Massimo, what are your thoughts? No, it's essentially, I agree. In general, I do think that blockchains, by definition, uh, are always more public than private uh, and are always uh, uh, more open than closed, you know, by definition. That's where you, you see their, their, their power better. But I agree that depending on, on the use cases, we may have different definitions of that, you know, because there are businesses that do not need to be, to be open to, to everyone, you know. But going back, in a sense, to the title of the panel, uh, I do think that we always have to remember that, yes, transparency and openness is one of the big powers of blockchain. But that doesn't mean, you know, I mean, I'm still listed among uh, the creators of Corda, and uh, I work uh, in, in R3 for, for a few years, and I think that's great technology as well. But the more we, we, we manage to open, the more we manage to find transparency, the more we see that the power of this technology. Not necessarily on everything. I totally agree on this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Suzanne, does creating more transparency also create some complications? Yeah, it does. And, and I'll speak from, you know, I'll put my auditor hat on, my, you know, sort of finance person hat on. The, there's... Uh, one, and I'll, I'll bore you with, yeah, I was also an accounting professor, an auditor professor beforehand, so, so I'll have to tell you about this thing that auditors have to think about. We, have, we call them our five assertions, some call them seven assertions, apparently auditors can't just agree on the numbers here. But there's things like, you know, does this thing really exist? How much is this thing worth? Um, who absolute, who owns this? What are the rights and obligations around this? Do we have the complete picture? So completeness is an assertion. And so when you when you bring blockchain and the technology into the financial system, you help actually in many ways. So I'll start with the, the with the good news is I can see who owns things better. I can confirm that ownership better. I have methods now and something Luca does to help value what's in the financial system, you know, better. I can see, you know, complete, you know, I have better sort of view potentially on completeness. But the complexity, and you can talk to any auditor either in the room or out there on the promenade or, you know, your, your favorite auditor, the, the audit sort of techniques that you need for understanding those five assertions or seven assertions, you need to improve those. You need to find new, new methods you know, to actually identify who really owns this thing. And, and so the auditors have had to change their processes, update their processes, keep learning themselves. But the, the, the good news is I do think the benefits really are stronger than the cost, but there are some complexities that, that get introduced. And I see you're going to weigh in on that, which I love. I, I, no, I, was, I, I, I wasn't going to argue with you, uh, <laughs> but I will eventually, I'm sure. Um, no, I, look, I was going to just say, you know, trans, it's not just transparency for transparency's sake. You know, to yeah. whom and on what matters, um, particularly if we want to really develop this technology and have it take off at scale. 
privacy also matters in the context of certain you know market constructs and so on. Uh, you know the 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 whole sort of concept of whale trade tracking, though you know that that that's that's not going to really fly in institutional trading markets. I and mean, it's not to say in the world of brokers and dealers, brokers and dealers aren't tracking who's got what and trying to understand you know all that kind of thing. But still, uh, these safeguards. And I think you know it's it's a pity to me that I feel sort of before the onset of the crypto winter or whatever we call it, you know there was a coalition between the traditional industry and and the blockchain industry, the crypto industry to to get sort of some more regulation and so, so, so on, so that we could really see this take off at scale, and that's been put backwards. Can, can I throw one sort of like provocative statement Please out there do. about a benefit of transparency? So I just finished watching the Madoff documentary on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it, right? But um, uh, so, so here's a gentleman who uh, was committing financial fraud for 40 years, okay? Uh, that was all paper-based, so he was able to forge things, and they didn't even do it in that sophisticated of a way. They were using the, like that old paper to put statements on. It was it was crazy, um, but he was able to keep this uh, going because it was all analog. It was all paper. So now let's talk about the elephant in the room <laughs> with any discussion about blockchain and crypto and that sort of stuff. SBF, right? Um, uh, Classic financial folly, classic human grift, which often comes into financial innovations, especially when money in the world is hot, interest rates are low, and all that sort of stuff. But because it was on the blockchain, uh, we were able to figure it out uh, in a relatively uh, quick manner, right? Uh, maybe a manner of months, maybe years if, if he had started. But it happened really fast, that downfall. So I think that's a benefit of the transparency. Um, that it can actually, you know, help root out fraudsters. Um, uh, so, anyway. I think that's a really good point, actually, isn't it? You know, had SBF been doing this 40 years ago, you know, he might only just be getting caught now. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a crazy thought. Um, Massimo, what do you think about, you know, does transparency add complications? Well, uh, after talking about SBF, it's hard to say transparency adds complication. O opacity <laughs> still adds more, you know, for 100 percent. No, no, but I, I, I definitely like the, the last comment. You know, I, 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 I was here or there, you know, uh, also uh, du during the financial crisis, and if we remember what happened, you know, and uh, we were we were talking of uh, similar size in a sense, you know, some trillions of. Uh, of exposures and so on, but in that case, uh, all the governments had to intervene, you know, to, to actually uh, save the world, bail out and so on. In the end, the SBF crisis, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, solved itself quite dramatically, quite rapidly, but without extending so much. So in, it may happen with many things that I've noticed, you know, in, uh, in blockchain, that at times people are surprised by bizarre things, like, for example, that human beings do not change, you know, and uh, uh, fraudsters can use different technologies, you know, and are still, if they are good fraudsters, are good fraudsters, you know, and, but uh, um, in the end, uh, the, 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 the outrage around blockchain created by this event may turn into recognizing how much more painful something like that would have been outside the blockchain space. And we are talking about what was essentially a fully centralized business, you know. But yet, you know, under many points of view, there were more things that were visible than, uh, than in, the, um, in the traditional business. So yes, I, I'd like to... Uh, to think of, even even for myself that come from from traditional finance, you know, where privacy is super respected, when banks do not want other banks knowing which kind of trades they do. At times, it would be better, you know, that they know your trades, you know their trades, and all together, for example, you can measure the enormous risk you are creating. You know, think of the CDS market, uh, and I'm not talking of the CDO, think of the CDS market. Uh, Back, you know, back back during the the, the financial crisis, uh, some people mention uh, privacy, you know, as, as a problem of transparency. But if you look at the public blockchain, one positive aspect is that it's not so difficult to track people if you really want, you know. And yet, uh, 
people use for financial dealings, blockchains for DeFi and so on, myself as well, obviously need to be people with some experience. I do have some, even more than some, maybe on, on financial products, but without worrying particularly about transparency. Why, why one should, you know? So I would say, let's not overstate. I think that the, the problems of opacity are much bigger than the problems of transparency in the end. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Ted, when we're talking about public chains, should we be concerned where miners are located? For instance, you know, should we worry if miners are located in jurisdictions that are sanctioned? Um, well, I, I think well, uh, certainly, you know, one comment on the, you know, the, the, the benefits of transparency. Just to you know, build on a couple of them is, is, you know, when you look at the war in Ukraine, I think it's another really key use case as well as SBF and. You know, there's been commentary around, you know, uh, whether, you know, people have been trying to get around sanctions in different parts of the world. I have seen no evidence for that at all, and plenty of evidence to say uh, that actually we, there's been benefits and tracking benefits around sanctions on the blockchain and with crypto. Um, so, you know, but nevertheless, you know, in answer to your question, I, I feel that it's sort of not, men, not really a judgmental question. I, th I think that the... Uh, the regulators and, and supervisors will simply want to um, impose restrictions on where uh, where people are located. Um, I, I think that's just the, the reality, and that that happened last year. I think that the U.S. did actually um, uh, introduce um, restrictions on miners from Russia, uh, and I, th I think you know that there is a desire to understand you know every part of the value chain and where that's physically located. To have jurisdictional control, so I, I expect that that will probably be a feature as the system gets built out. Suzanne, how how easy or difficult is that going to be, though? I mean, our industry—it's all about being open, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, the, it is one of those things where you know the ethos in our industry and how it started is you know everyone should should be free to do you know their thing and and sort of take advantage of this new. Um, innovative technology, and one of the things, I'll just tie back to a panel um, earlier today, because I, I, I love how everything sort of, some of the messages and, and, and it, insights really can carry forward from panel to panel, and um, one of the points that, that got brought up was this sort of the way KYC works in the traditional financial services industry, um, is that they're, you know, you know, an expert in the room mentioned there's like a 99.5% false positive that sort of identifies you, you know, incorrectly as, as a problematic person. And then we also know VPN exists out there and all sorts of other sort of things that can be done, you know, to work around this. So, so there are complexities to it. It's, it's, it is, you're right, absolutely, you know, governments and, and policymakers will want to pay attention to this and, and this will matter to them. But we do, it's, it's not a simple answer quite yet to solve it, I guess. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of more questions, but I want to open up to the audience before I get to them so that we don't miss your questions. Does anybody have a question for the panel? Okay, fantastic. Hi, I'm Rod Baxter. Thank you. I'm one of three million GBBC ambassadors. Um, no, thrilled to be here. A great, great program. Um, you know, we talk about the transparency in, in, in the blockchain, and one countervailing force is, of course, you know, you, you may know an address, but one of the whole ideas of the culture is anonymity as well, and that goes quite contrary to transparency. But the one I think is more interesting and salient is the issue of DeFi itself is transforming the underlying assets into something completely different. And so you might, have, you might see where the FTX blocks went, except you don't know that they got lent to somebody else or a, a, a derivative contract was created. This happened in derivatives as well. I have been involved in ISDA since its founding in 1985. It was founded by my boss at Morgan Stanley back then. And, it, and, and I remember a call I had from the comptroller of the currency about 15 years ago. And he said, Rod, Rod, we want to get better disclosure on derivatives on bank balance sheets. And we want to have these new matrices. And I just said, stop, stop. The only way to have transparency on derivative contracts of banks is to publish them in their entirety. Maybe redact counterparties or dates or some private information. But unless you have 100% of the data, because an interest rate swap can be a loan. 
or it can be an option. And because you put it, so, so what I want to put to the panel is, we can talk about transparency, but let's talk about DeFi, which is creative and important and wonderful, but what it does to transparency, what, what your thoughts are and how we as an industry should think about and develop practices. Competition about who is answering the question. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you for the, for the splendid question. Uh, we, we have been talking about transparency and because it was in, in the title of this of, of this panel, but the, there is much more, you know, to using to using a blockchain. And when it comes to DeFi, I would say that automation is is probably even more important, and programmability. Let's say, I, I have a funny story, you know. During the the Terra Luna collapse, uh, I was in a panel in Milan, you know, a traditional finance panel, but we were talking about th these topics as well. And then I stayed there the whole afternoon, you know. I had some investments in uh, DeFi, you know, not not Terra Luna. I, I think it was it was it was our currency, but uh, uh, it lost uh, like the rest of the market, you know. So my positions were liquidated during the afternoon. I was there; there was nothing to do. But my counterparties, whoever they are, didn't lose a single penny, you know. And and that's DeFi, you know. That's DeFi. And uh, th there were no losses. Uh, for me, obviously, I wasn't particularly happy because, in a sense, it didn't turn out a a as, as I wanted, you know. So part, part of my collateral was seized, you know, to close, to close my position. But can I tell you something? It worked perfectly. Uh, back in the time in which I, I was adding the, the group of mathematicians uh, doing models for derivatives and imp implementing them, uh, uh, that could have been a dream, you know. An incredible default, collateral moved during few hours, counterparties were unaffected. That was a dream. Myself, in a sense, uh, like, uh, you know, n not the creditor, but the debitor, losing a little bit of collateral was not a tragedy. So on, on the other side of a big problem that we tend to associate to DeFi, but the biggest problems were, were, were the levers that were still moved manually, you know, by, 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 by Quan, the, 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 the infrastructure of DeFi actually worked perfect, you know. And I'm talking like a person that uh, was actually liquidated at the margin call and no time, you know, to, to answer. But because of the speed of the market, uh, that was the only way to ensure that uh, the other parties were protected. And they were. So in a sense, we are already reaching incredible things, you know, through DeFi. How much they can start being used also in, in, in the traditional financial system? Yes, I think it's something we have to start uh, uh, talking about. Can we improve and incredibly, you know, but starting from the fact that we have tools uh, that, uh, that could not be imagined before. You know. You know, I was just going to build on something, Corey, you said earlier on, which I think there are different versions of this for different use cases, and we should be comfortable with that. You know, I, I do get probably a bit more excited about uh, attacking the traditional institutional market, just because a lot of the benefits we talked about around, you know, risk management and cost reduction and AML, all those sorts of things, actually, you've got to get at the traditional market to, to get to that. And um, so we, we ran and published an experiment last year. It was actually sponsored by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. It was called Project Guardian. Uh, and JP Morgan were involved, DVS were involved, SBI Digital Asset and Holding were involved. And the idea was to design a blockchain which was public but permissioned so there was a trustworthy participant sort of structure to create you know, token, token real assets. Uh, and the experiment was run on FX and on government bonds you know, and was you know, considered a great success and very successful. And if you could kind of bring that in and start to scale that up, I mean, that would be transformational. So just, oh, there we go again. Um, I turn it off instead of on. Um, I think what everyone has said so far in this and that your point is really, really well taken and I'll sort of build off of something Corey said earlier as well when he described Circle's approach to publishing, you know, sort of what, what is the, you know, sort of the backing what it, and down to the QCIP level, to that level of granularity. And to your point about, you know, the answer is publish all the, you know, 
publish the, the contracts, you know, write, you know, maybe scrub out the names. And, you know, so when I was talking earlier, I was talking about the transparency along as the transaction moves along, but then also transparency around what the it is that's moving along. And, you know, so again, building back to this QCIP idea is imagine a world where, you know, you've got 50,000 plus different kinds of crypto assets and, you know, you classify those. You know, you look at every single white paper because those are transparent, those are available, all the features, what it is the, the, the crypto asset is trying to do. You know, you can also monitor what it actually is doing because it's the white paper match how it actually is working. And you, you can end up with a very, it's a, it's a lot of work. Luke has done it and we've classified along 150 plus fields, 50,000 plus of these contracts. So you can actually see what the it is that's moving through and understand what you're looking at. And you build on the transparency that's in the smart contracts, but you have to do the work to sort of pull it all together. Thank you. Um, last question, Corey, I'm going to come to you first. We've spoken a lot this week at GBBC about using blockchain for good. Um, you know, really trying to use blockchain for social justice and socially responsible endeavors. Does increasing transparency in financial services and blockchain help achieve more of that, do you think? Well, absolutely. And <clears throat> let me just give you one example. Um, we recently partnered with UNHCR uh, to deliver aid to refugees in the Ukraine. And <clears throat> One of the problems with uh, aid delivery is you never know where it's going, right? Um, I had a friend who uh, was in the U.S. military um, and during Iraq reconstruction was running huge pallets of cash around the country. Uh, and uh, it was not only dangerous for him, but a lot of that money disappeared. It did not go to the right people. So. Now, today, we can send over the blockchain, USDC, circles US dollar coin, um, to uh, recipients and know precisely uh, that the right people are getting it. So that's, that's a level of transparency. We can also, afterwards, um, uh, see whether they're cashing it out. Um, so we, we have a partnership uh, with MoneyGram. Uh, where you can basically take your phone that, you know, you're, you're carrying value across borders, right, in a much safer way than carrying cash, um, for what it's worth. Uh, and you can take it to a MoneyGram and cash it out. Um, so we can see if that's happened. Or you can see whether or not it's circulating on the chain. And we found, um, we did something similar in Venezuela to, uh, with um, frontline pandemic workers who weren't being paid by the Maduro government and we worked with the Treasury and State Department to do that. And what we saw was a lot of USDC simply circulating on chain because they didn't want to cash it out. It was a better store of value than um, certainly the Bolivar in Venezuela. Um, and you know, people are just making small payments to each other just like you might do with Venmo. So having that level of knowledge is a very, very powerful thing for um, uh, aid organizations uh, among others. Uh, can I chime in on that as well? Just because that is something that um, I've really been inspired by. You know, we, we co-sponsored an event with Circle in London that was supporting Ukrainian refugees and learned a lot of the work they were doing and, and that the UNHCR was doing as well. You know, there's other organizations that are trying to do the same thing or something similar. And, you know, I had the wonderful opportunity in these rooms to meet um, a gentleman from the International Fund for Agriculture Development. And, and it's extremely inspiring because that, that, that brings a, an opportunity for traceability of the funds to millions and millions of farmers who need that those funds out there. It also, um, it isn't just about traceability, but there's this other side to it. And, and again, tying back to what Corey says is that if donors know that your release of funds is, and what you're doing with it is traceable, is reliable, it's going where it's intended to be, then it brings more donors to the tables, to, to organizations that really, really will benefit from that. And then ultimately the, the folks that they're helping. Can I add just one side point to that, because when you mentioned ag, um, 
this other example came to mind. So there's all sorts of company. I since I work at Circle, I'm thinking about the movement of money and value. But blockchains can obviously be used to track all sorts of other things. And I'm actually a small investor in a, a small company that tracks uh, uh, from seed to table or from protein to table, where you can see precisely where your food went. Uh, I was previously deputy general counsel at Department of Agriculture in the U.S. And there's a lot of produce coming in the U.S. that people think is organic, uh, that uh, there's no way of actually proving that, right, from overseas suppliers. And they've found that, you know, in some of these um, factories or farms, they're not actually following the practices that we're then paying for. Um, uh, expecting a different kind of product. So it's just another great use case for blockchain that directly goes back to transparency. Yeah, absolutely. I love that example. Matsumo, did you want to add no, anything? There's something that came to my mind in talking about this fantastic, uh, uh, I mean, case study in a sense that, uh, and actually, actual usage uh, that was, was telling us about at UNHR. But in my opinion, we have to think of another thing that we often talk about the blockchain uh, as a place which is transparent, uh, but is anonymous, you know, that's, that's, that's the typical narrative. To say the truth, blockchain in a sense runs on the internet, and uh, in the internet is one of the few networks uh, uh, where there is a very clear representation and usage of uh, an autonomous identity. So everyone that uses the blockchain actually creates its own credentials and is always able to come back to, to any application and show that he did something because that was digitally signed by, by him. And it can become the natural phone. I mean, yesterday I was at an event about you know digital identity and everyone was saying, it doesn't necessarily need to be on blockchain. It doesn't necessarily need to be on blockchain. When people say that too often, you start suspecting that probably it necessarily needs to be on blockchain, you know, otherwise there, there wouldn't be any point in repeating that. Mm -hmm. Yes, because blockchain, in a sense, uh, uh, is uh, introducing for the first time as a fundamental element the fact that anyone is responsible of the identity he is using when he is actually interacting with, uh, with the service, you know, and science digitally and so on. This may have an enormous power when it is extended, you know, into traditional finance, in some cases even into, into charity. And uh, uh, so in a sense, uh, blockchain can also be the place of uh, uh, identity. And that's something that together with transparency for some use cases can have an enormous, enormous power. Absolutely. Um, Ted, any last thoughts? Nothing to add. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the panellists, Suzanne, Ted, Corey and Massimo. Big thank you. And um, I'll pass over to Abdul now. Thank you, Emma. Thank you.